not everybody is here, but I think I'll start because some of it is just introductory stuff. And um, what I want to do is go through this session, lecture 19, and after that, any questions about things that you might be wanting to know before we go over and take the short quiz. And see, a short quiz is anything that takes less than one day. Um, so, here are some new ideas and formats in fracture mechanics, and most of this is work that we generated at University of Tennessee and in collaboration with somebody in South America. So, since this is a university and uh, I came from a university, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about our university as an introduction and then show you some of the work that we've done. I was at University of Tennessee, which has the main campus in Knoxville, Tennessee. And here's the picture again. Knoxville is in the east part of Tennessee. Uh, the distance from left to from here to here is about 800 kilometers. So it's it's not real big, but not real small either. The um, main campus is there but there are five other campuses scattered around especially notable is Memphis which is way at the other end has a medical school and a dental school so the medical dental part is not here in Knoxville where we are uh, we have all the scientific things engineering arts and sciences and and everything else then um, tell you a little bit about U.S. universities. Uh, all, most of the universities, except for some of the real prestigious one, are known for their American football teams. That seems to be more important in academic matters. Uh, Harvard, Yale, and some of the real prestigious ones do have football teams, but they don't put so much emphasis on that. If you want to go to Harvard or Yale, it costs, they're what we call private universities. It costs so much that most people don't earn that much in a year to send their children there. So in order to go to some of those, you have to be very rich or very poor. You get what's called a scholarship to pay your way or very, very bright, maybe you get a scholarship. Otherwise, you have to go to something like this, a state school. Uh, University of Tennessee was founded by the state of Tennessee and was um, it is much cheaper because there's some state support in that. Although, if you send somebody to a state school, you still cost a lot of money, maybe about 20% of your salary. So most people borrow a lot of money and then they have to pay it off. And, and it's uh, fairly expensive for university education. The uh, American football teams is big at Tennessee and the idea is to be in top 25, which Tennessee is, but better yet to be in the top 10. Uh, if you're an American football player, you can go to the university free. They you get what's called a football scholarship. And sometimes it's unbelievable uh, the caliber of students that come to play football. There was one case I read about the football player didn't know how to read or write but was a university student. And the big disappointment in his life was he thought he was a wonderful player and they wrote about him in a newspaper frequently, but he couldn't read the newspaper articles because he didn't know how to read it. He was disappointed he couldn't read the wonderful stuff about him. So, uh, tells you a little bit about that. Here's some data. University of Tennessee is more than 200 years old. And there are, this is a little bit old, but it doesn't change much. So within about 10% of this is this many students and undergraduate going for a bachelor degree and graduate going for uh, an advanced degree, master, PhD. This is interesting, faculty and staff, a little bit more than 12,000, but faculty 1,500. 
So most of the people associated with the university aren't faculty. Uh, read about the olden times, like 100 years ago or so, the faculty was a primary person on the university. Now they're just kind of pushed to the side and they're not, not as important as the rest of the people there doing things that I don't know what they do, but um, <laughs> perhaps a lot of them are there to hinder the faculty rather than help. Anyway, we are in what's called College of Engineering and some 2,000 students are there, undergraduate, graduate, and faculty is 125. And um, one of the features, well, two of them, when they come in to be engineers, they start in a common freshman program because freshman courses for all the departments are the same. I, I put up here nine departments, things like uh, mechanical, civil, chemical, material science, those kinds of things. One of the special departments that aren't in a lot of universities is called a uh, nuclear department, where they are more uh, f fixed on nuclear power generation. So that, that's one that's unique. Uh, they are only, oh, I don't know, about 10 or 12 in the country. Anyway, that the other thing that we have is called co-op program for undergraduate students who, uh, instead of going and studying straight through, will take two or three semesters and then they go one semester out to work in a job. And then they come back and do a couple more semesters of study and then go out and work on a job. That's called co-op. And um, it takes them longer but most of the students who want to get a job after a bachelor degree rather than going to graduate school can get a job with that company if they like that company and that company likes them. So that helps people who want to go work to get a, a position. Usually our graduates get positions all over the country, not necessarily in Tennessee, but all over the country. And this is the department I was part of. It's called mechanical, aerospace, and biomedical engineering. And we have acronyms, maybe. Sounds sort of tentative, like you're not sure about it or not. So it's the maybe department. We have uh, degrees in mechanical, aerospace, biomedical, and a student, after he does the common uh, pre freshman program, freshman is year one, would decide then to go in one of these specialties and get a bachelor degree. And then uh, we also give PhD, M master degree and PhD, and there's another one called engineering science that's added to that, which is sort of a, a generic one. You can do a variety of things uh, and, and get that. And we also have then a cooperation with a business college. A lot of engineers think if you're an engineer, you make okay money, but you don't get rich. So they want to be a big time boss. And so to be a big time boss, it's good to have MBA, which is Masters of Business Administration. So you get a master in business administration and then work as an engineer for a while and then eventually you could be a big time boss. We have 28 faculty and we're the biggest department since there's three specialties. So nine departments in the College of Engineering, 40% of the students undergraduate are part of the, this department. So that's almost half, not quite half, a little bit less in graduate school. So that, that's a background here. I wanted to bring up some new work and some of the problems that you may have been aware of as we went along. So one is fracture toughness testing. It's too difficult and expensive for a lot of people. Uh, for example, if you want to do a K1C test, it might cost five or ten times what a Sharpie test or a tensile test costs. I showed you last week, long time ago, how people use Sharpie energy sometimes and make a correlation rather than doing the K1C. This is expensive, but not too difficult. You saw with the J1C testing, it's very difficult to, to do the test and to analyze it. And some average labs 
uh, just can't do it. As I s told you when, when we went over that, best thing if you aren't set up to do that is send it to an outside lab that specializes in J1C testing, but that can be expensive. The, the other problem are there's some materials that don't work for the, these methods, and I'll show you some materials that we tested using a different approach. And then I want to talk a little bit about K and compliance solutions and a new format for that. So this work is developed at University of Tennessee by my students and I cooperated sometimes with uh, Professor Juan Donoso at a uh, university in Chile. And we, we traveled and visited back and forth for a while. Uh, we were doing it just about every year. And now he's retired and I'm retired, so we don't cooperate anymore, but we developed some things. Here are some of the ideas, normalization, common formats, and test simplification. So here's some of the challenges for J1C tests. They're usually conducted using unloading compliance, the elastic unloading compliance. So here, here it is. One specimen is loaded, unloaded, loaded, unloaded, and the inverse slope is called compliance. Here's the slope, inverse is called compliance, and then you can develop the R curve. And um, you measure crack length using compliance BEV over P and the principle that the crack, length, crack length relates to elastic properties of material. So back here. Uh, this is a difficult test and some labs can't do it. Many labs can't because of if your equipment isn't really good sometimes you do the little unload and load and instead of getting a nice slope here you get a little bit of a loop. If you get a little bit of a loop then it's a question where do you take the slope and does that relate to the crack length if you have a loopy slope here. And the other thing some materials like polymers are viscoelastic and they, they don't have purely elastic properties but they have elastic uh, and viscoelastic properties, which means they sort of stretch and they for sure when they go load unload develop loops. So it's hard to know how to do that. So I'll show you a different method. But anyway, this develops what's called the R curve, which most R curves are a plot of a fracture parameter versus crack extension. And they're for materials that don't fail real nice and neat like they don't go bang and you get two pieces instead they just kind of ooze apart and we went over this but the, the thing is you get blunting and then you get initiation here and then you get continued crack growth out here and in order to find the initiation and get a single value of toughness like the J1C then you need this complicated construction and it looks like a big mess and uh, the reason it looks like a big mess is because it is. So this was something we did a couple days ago but that's that's the J construction and this is the J using elastic properties. Now the second thing that was obvious is that plasticity properties of a material can also be used to determine crack length besides elastic properties. Um, something like this, identical specimens and materials have identical nonlinear load versus displacement records. So here's, here's some examples. If you start with initial crack size A0 and for some reason you don't let the crack extend and one way to do that is make a blunt notch rather than a sharp crack. So if it's a blunt notch you can load up here and you can make another specimen with a little bit longer one and load here. Those don't have growing cracks so um, the, growing, the one with the growing crack would reach the same point that the non-growing crack would reach. Let's see if I can explain it that makes sense. So say you start with a, a sharp crack specimen 
that's going to grow the crack. It's going to grow the crack like this. Blunt, sharp tip, continue growth. So it's going to grow like that. So if it grows, when it gets to this point, well, it starts with initial crack size A0. When it gets to this point, it would have crack length A1. When it gets to that point, it would have crack length A2. So in order to use the normalization, you need to be able to generate these sets of curves for non-growing cracks and then compare the growing crack one with those sets of curves. Now you can do that experimentally or you can do that uh, analytically that, that I'll show you at least briefly how that, that would work. So here, here's a test and I couldn't get rid of that blue thing, made a mess, but anyway, here's a test. Here's a specimen that doesn't grow the crack. It would be blunt. So all these points on here, load and displacement, are continually uh, having plasticity and keep going up and up because the crack's not growing. Almost, well, always for metals at least, as you grow, as you load, you get what's called hardening. So the load keeps going up and up as you load and unless a crack grows you don't you don't see any uh, of this. Now the red one or the, blue, the purple ones here would be growing the crack so they go up and up and up and then the crack starts to grow and then reaches a maximum load and comes back down. And so the difference here is crack can be related to crack extension and can help you make draw an R curve. So develop this thing normalization for JR curves. Normalization is related to total load and displacement differences. The JR curve can be continuous. So as you go along, um, you, you don't need point wise necessarily. You don't need to go point by point, but you can have then continual differences. So you can have a co continuous R curve. So going back to show you this again, here the R curve is point by point. Now if it's a single specimen with unloading compliance, each point is one unload. So you have point by point, which is good enough, but it takes a fit. But if you do the normalization, you can have this as a continuously smooth curve and not point by point. then the J1C construction procedure can be related to the continuous curve or you could do point by point if you want. That's the idea of the normalization. So normalization was developed, we pretty much started at University of Tennessee and now as part of the ASTM method as an alternative to using elastic, uh, use the plastic properties. As I said before, if you don't have good elastic slopes like polymers, it's uh, good for that. I'll show you some polymer testing. If you have rapid load, then you can't stop and do unloads. Rapid load being in the order of milliseconds, maybe. And in milliseconds, you can develop these curves, but you can't stop and do unloads when you have, when you have a rapidly loaded uh, thing and you can uh, generate crack length at the end of the test rather than doing it in, in the middle of the test. So the normalization had some advantages that, that were good. And we applied that to biomedical polymers. So show you a little bit about polymer testing. Uh, they have viscoelastic properties and don't develop nice load unload curves for using elastic compliance. So rather use the normalization. Uh, the polymer load being viscoelastic would have a time dependencies. So properties depend on the loading rate. However, if you do consistent loading rates, you can do a relative comparison of properties. So fracture toughness developed at a consistent rate would rank toughness order the material. 
interesting thing for me about this, a biomedical company fellow came and wanted to do tests, and since we had been using this normalization, these curves have time dependency, so they depend on the loading rate. But what they were interested in was a comparison. They didn't tell me what the materials exactly were, but they said this is material one, material two, material three. We're supposed to test and see which ones look better. So, so we did that and get relative ranking. And then I guess they use the relative ranking. Uh, here's the specimens, polymer specimens. A little bit about them. They're used in hip and knee replacement and they're usually lubrication material. So, so the metal ball kind of thing fits in your hip socket. But uh, the reason you get a hip replacement in the first place is what they call arthritis, where you get the, the tissue in there wears all away because you got too old. Um, and then you get the hip replacement metal rubbing on a polymer. Now, um, I don't know how long they last. Mine's about three years old. And if they last 20 years, they hope you die before you need a new one. If people get hip replacements when they're about 40 years old, they probably don't last a full lifetime. And they, they may need another. And every time they get another one, it gets worse because they lose some of their bone material. Anyway, these were high-density polyethylene with special treatments. And as I told you, they didn't tell me what the special treatments were, but uh, just that they were. And, and the standard elastic unloading didn't work so we used we used uh, normalization so here here's a specimen in the clevises they were compact geometry the regular ones like we use for metal and they use pin and clevis loading and the loading rate we tried to make consistent now it wasn't really rapid load it was a test that would run about 30 seconds so the full test would be about 30 seconds. And we kept the same loading rate for every specimen that we did. Here's an example of, of some of the data. Now, uh, number one and number two are higher. Number three is lower. And these are the R curves. We developed R curves and, and didn't do a J1C analysis on these, but just R curves. So the people then could look at number three here and say, oh, it's not nearly as good as number one and number two because the R curve is lower. And as I said, it wasn't a specific number they were interested in, but the ranking, knowing that this is a lot better toughness than that. Uh, since the material is, is used doing uh, compression mostly it's it's to lubricate the socket I'm not sure why tension was an interest but they never told me why tension was an interest just just that it was here's a whole bunch of specimens we did once you once you uh, did the test then you could see um, here is the um, specimen sur fracture surface they didn't pre-crack in fatigue, but rather we got a real sharp razor blade and pushed it in. So the sharp razor blade gave, gave a uh, sharp crack that is equivalent to a pre-crack, but th these didn't fatigue nicely. So we tried to fatigue some of them and it didn't, just didn't work. So we did all that razor blade notching. And I think in some uh, brittle materials, people do that too. Uh, put something sharp in there rather than try to fatigue them. Um, then if you're going to use normalization, you need an analytical format to relate load and displacement. And the main principle we used was load separation, which separates functions of geometry and deformation and led to what we call the concise uh, concise format. So here's a concise format. The load is some coefficient. That's just the coefficient. That's a function of crack length 
and that's a function of deformation. Now the uh, one uh, fellow I worked with a long time ago developed this idea that you could separate a load into a geometry part and a deformation part and the two could be multiplied together so they they aren't uh, coupled at all and it that's quite a interesting idea then we thought well if this is not coupled at all then whatever happens with the geometry doesn't influence what happens with the deformation and vice versa so if the deformation is elastic you have an elastic H function. If it's plastic, you have a plastic H function. If it's um, creep, we also did this, I did this some years ago for creep. If it's creep, you have a creep H function. And then the geometry function should be the same for every material because it doesn't depend on the material. So this is completely geometry dependent, G for geometry, they call it H for hardening. H is a completely material part. Here's how it could be written. It was written as a function of the ligament and not the crack length. So the ligament is the W, the total width minus the crack length is the ligament. And the geometry function could be written in this way, where W, of course, is width, V is thickness, and the exponent is a coefficient and it's the same coefficient that, that's used in the J formula that we had a couple of days ago. So th this is the way the geometry function works. Now, th the fact that you could use this geometry function um, and it's separate from the material properties, we thought try this for different types of deformation. And if you use this, for K solutions and compliance solutions, you can get a simple form called the concise form. Um, K, as it was developed, and this is mostly from finite element analysis, and it was developed uh, 50 years ago, was a polynomial fit. So what they did to get this K solution was to uh, do finite element for different crack lengths and then fit the results somehow. And this is the little f. You might recognize the little f from your table. It has this polynomial form, which is quite difficult to calculate. Now, if you write it instead of being in terms of the crack length, in terms of the ligament W minus A, you can get a form that's much sm shorter than this. and um, is much easier to, to do and gives gives about the same solution as, as this. And maybe it's more accurate because this one is just to fit the finite element analyses and, and this is actual behavior. And the compliance, this is BE, C stands for uh, V over P, V E V over P, the thing in your table. Again was, was a um, polynomial that's fairly complicated five orders here six terms but you could write it very simply if you use the concise form only going with the, the ligament rather than the crack length so these this is the the idea of concise forms and help with the normalization consequences here uh, fraction mechanics equations are typically typically written in polynomial format, but with a concise form, they can be written much simpler and make your analytical calculations much simpler with these. Now, uh, I think I'll show you this later, but um, the consequences of that, use normalization for determining crack length from load versus displacement record, use the concise form for writing simple fraction mechanics parameters in a simple and concise form. These haven't been taken over by the standards people yet. And um, show you why. why. Um, so 
one other idea. How can you simplify some of the test methods? You all agree with me that the J1C test is fairly complex, not only difficult to run, but once you get the data, it's a lot of work to analyze the data, doing, uh, doing that computation or uh, the, the little graph with all the fittings and everything. And so if you want a single point, that construction gets to be quite a problem. Um, the, the idea that, that would be nice is if you could get a point directly on load versus displacement record rather than doing the construction. So here's some thought behind getting a point on load versus displacement. And I'll show you some, some graphs of this. Crack growth starts between the first deviation from linearity and the maximum load. So here's the schematic load and displacement. So here is a straight line with no plasticity and then after a while plasticity develops. Now crack growth causes deviation from linearity but so does plasticity. So when you load up here and it starts to deviate, just looking at load and displacement you don't know if the deviation is from crack growth or from plasticity. It could be from one or the other. But uh, crack growth can never occur before deviation from linearity because once you get crack growth, you get the deviation. So you know if you have completely linear behavior, there's no crack growth. Now the second point is that the load drop from, from maximum is caused by crack growth. So you know for sure that the crack is growing by the time maximum load is reached. And, um, so this point, uh, you can see, if you don't have crack growth, the curve hardens and keeps going up, up, up. But if it turns around and starts going down again, that relates to crack growth. So back here again, the, the two kind of limits are the first deviation, no crack growth before that, and the maximum load, you're assured to have crack growth by the time you get to maximum load. So uh, where in that thing is actual uh, beginning of crack growth? It's a little hard to say. But the idea is if you could somehow relate a point on the load displacement curve that is, is the beginning of, of uh, crack growth, that would be nice. So here's the idea. Um, the uh, construction procedure is not the very beginning of crack growth, but close to it. We talked about that. You can't tell exactly where it begins, but close to that. So if you pick the J1C on load versus displacement, it should be, well, after deviation, somewhere near the maximum load, but maybe not exactly there. Um, The J1C from the construction procedure put it on on a test, and I did this with several tests. And you can see uh, this specimen was used to do the construction procedure and get J1C. And the exact point where J1C occurred was right here. You can see it's well past deviation, but not quite to maximum load yet. Now. Um, The when it get back here, um, don't know where I put that, but I was going to tell you that the construction procedure often gives you yeah here um, point on the load displacement record might not be completely accurate, but the construction procedure when people do that has some scatter to it. And some of that scatter depends on the test technique. And so um, we did what's called the round robin one time and gave people the same data and had them do this construction procedure and they got different answers from each other. 
So the construction procedure and the, the regular way to do J1C just doesn't um, always give you consistent answers. There's some scatter to that. So if there's a little bit of scatter, then picking a point here with a little bit of scatter wouldn't be any worse and so much simpler. If you did this, you run the test, have an idea where to pick that point, and then from that point get a, an initiation toughness that avoids the construction procedure and, and all that mess. Now one of the difficulties in doing that is you have to get that into the standards. And most people working on standards reject the idea of improving on their work. So if you go to them and say, let's change the standards and make it simpler like this, uh, they said, well, we did all that work for, for years and years. We don't want to change it. And take somebody who is kind of the champion of this, who says, come on, we're going to change it. Let's work on that. And I would have to be that. But I stopped working on standards once I retired. I have no support to go work on standards and I have to pay out of my own pocket and all the work on standards is voluntary. I don't mind volunteering my time but I don't want to volunteer my money for travel and working on the standards. So I stopped working on standards. So essentially there's nobody to push these ideas which is a little bit of a shame. So a little bit of a summary here there's a need to improve fracture mechanics testing and evaluation. Tests are just too complicated. Everybody agrees to that. Nobody wants to do anything about it. So that, that's a standard in all fields. Everybody complains about what's going on, but nobody wants to change it. So uh, government, science, whatever. However, ASTM standards have to be evaluated and reapproved re every five years. If there would be a champion, you might take that over. Now, some of the papers I've reviewed recently have some good ideas to put into the standards. And these are often from Asia and from India as well. And when I do the review, I often say, this is a good idea. It's too bad you can't put this in the standards. Now, somebody in India probably doesn't have the resources to go to the standards meeting. They meet two times a year. That means traveling to the United States where they hold the meetings or, or Canada sometimes, but traveling long ways and then volunteering the time. So the workers who do these good, uh, develop these good ideas seem to have no opportunity to participate in, in the standard writing. So here we are, hoping that things will improve but knowing that they may not improve, improve anytime soon. Okay, that's, that's all I had uh, on this number 19 lecture. And still have a little bit of time in this session, so I'd like to see if there's any particular questions you have that you want to address. And if not, I guess we'll take a short break and then proceed over to the the testing place. I don't know where that is, but somebody here does, I guess. You know where the testing place is? You went this morning, didn't you? So you get two in one day? Two. Yeah, near, yeah. Okay, and they'll have the tests and stuff over there for us. So, questions? The test is at 4.30. Oh, I thought they would start it sooner because I said I only have one hour. We could start at 3.30. You think they'd be okay if we start at 3.30? Yeah. The only thing I had planned for tomorrow is going over what you did on the test. So 
I can see how you did, but we're supposed to have a session in the morning. Did you know about that? Now, I can't get a good reading on that. You're all going to come and get certificates of, of the wonderful work that you have done here. Something like that. And uh, I think you get patted on the back. That That's what we do in the United States. When somebody does wonderful work, we say, oh, wonderful work. But does it make you any richer? Uh, maybe they can... I think we get over in the morning, but I'm not sure. Does anybody here know? Yeah, I didn't have, this is, this was the last lecture that I had prepared, so I didn't have anything new, but we could go over the exam, but you, you probably do everything correctly anyway, and, and uh, don't need to go over it. 